Welcome to my CompTIA Security Plus Lecture Review. Here we're looking at the textbook CompTIA Security Plus Guide to Network Security Fundamentals, the 6th edition. We are covering the SY0501 Security Plus exam. Here's the ISBN number for the given text. My name is Arthur Solomon. I'm going to be working with you throughout this video lecture. One of the important things that I did want to point out is I am using this textbook, which is published by Cengage. All of the rights are reserved by them. This is just a video lecture of me going through the PowerPoints. Assuming that you are in my Security Plus course and you've already purchased the textbook. Keep in mind, I'm not covering every exact section of the textbook. I'm just covering highlights of the official PowerPoints produced and owned by Cengage. Welcome. In this lecture, we're looking at Chapter 1, an introduction to security. We have four main objectives. I know there's a typo. It should be 1112131414, but again, these are the official PowerPoints, so I'm not authorized to edit them. So there are four objectives. First objective is to describe the challenges for securing data and information, define information security, and explain why it's important. We're going to identify the types of attacks that are common today in modern society and modern culture. And lastly, we're going to describe the five basic principles of defense. While these are the main overall arching objectives for this lecture, we actually do cover a lot more material than just those four main areas. So, first of all, what are the challenges of securing data, of securing information? First and foremost, we have to understand that data and information are similar but not the same. Information is organized data that is meaningful. So that means to be able to secure it, we have to understand who may want to actually access it. So that is why it's not as simple because it may be data to me, it may be information for you. Well, if it's data for me, I'm not going to protect it the same way. So looking at what type of information is there, we have to provide the appropriate control to secure it. Are there guidelines for securing specific types of information? If it's medical records, if it's health data, if it's uh, educational records, there are mandates that govern the level of protection that it needs. If it is score reports for a video game or for a basketball game, well, that is, it's still important to be protected, but it may not have the same level of risk that would involve medical records. And just so that we're aware, medical records actually do have federal guidelines for protection. That's going to be HIPAA. If we're dealing with educational records, they're going to have federal mandates called FERPA. If they're credit card numbers, there's going to be industry guidelines, PCI, DSS. So it's not always the federal government that tells you the level of security. It could be the industry that mandates the level of protection. So it just really depends. Also, there's many ways to attack a system or a network or a company. So being able to protect data and information, there's lots of different avenues that you have to protect against from. So defending against the attacks are often very difficult. There's so many of them. However, it's not impossible. It's just normally we look at what is the, probably the most common types of attacks and we try to implement controls that prevent those types of attacks. Now, keep in mind, this is an ever evolving process. So just because it may be common today doesn't mean it's going to be common tomorrow. So we're going to have to assess on a regular basis our protection controls on that information, on that data, so we can ensure that we are doing the best that we can to protect that information, securing that information from those that aren't authorized to access it. One of the things to look at is we have to understand defending against the attacks. I mean, we know what the current attacks are. So some of the re recent types of attacks are going to be things like actually hijacking a car 
you can now actually take over a car's CAN bus and other control systems for a car. You can also take over airplanes if they're not secured. You can hijack systems through satellite uplinks if they're not protected. You have things like the traditional malware on a USB drive or uh, malware via text, uh, malware via websites. You have um, social engineering calls, it, uh, IRS fraud calls, that, those are constantly. You have the traditional large corporation hacks. Uh, recently, the SolarWinds hack where they've also infected uh, several Microsoft subsystems because of the same general type of code. Uh, you have data breaches protecting um, PII and other customer information that take forever to actually respond. But why do these happen? Why are these types of attacks successful? Well, first of all, widespread vulnerabilities. Each program takes hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lines of code. And there's bound to be vulnerabilities that are found. Uh, vulnerability that is not currently known that someone else has recently found, but is not known to the security uh, realm, is called the zero day. And zero day exploits are coming out almost every day. Another common reason is configuration issues. Realistically, networking and security staff sometimes are overworked and they make minor mistakes. They make configuration errors because things weren't planned out or a worker was overworked for too long or they're short staffed or so forth. Poorly designed software is also a big one. I know a lot of programmers that believe that they actually implement best security, uh, secure coding procedures in their software development but in reality, they're not. They don't didn't want to learn how to do it. Or it's just poor design. It could be poor QA uh, for the software and just no one caught the design bug. Could be an issue with hardware, uh, whether it be infrastructure hardware or actual device hardware. It could also be a enterprise issue. Enterprise could also be composed of internal threats, social engineering, bad policies, bad procedures, things of that nature. Well, these are some of the more successful attacks. Sometimes a, a successful attack is because the attacker is determined. If an attacker wants to get in, they will eventually get in. But the goal should be to make it hard enough for the attacker so that they lose interest. Also, one of the big reasons for attacks to be successful is because sometimes we don't know any better. As a defender, we may not understand how an attacker gets in, so we don't defend against those pathways. That's one of the larger areas that definitely attackers exploit. Social engineering is definitely increasing. So why are there difficulties in actually defending against the tax. Well, one of the things is universal connected devices. Essentially, everything is connected to the internet. And that means you have to now look at how to secure the thermostat, how to secure the refrigerator, how to secure the computers, the phones. But that's the thing. Once those devices are connected to the internet, that means there's a global community out there, the world, that can now be targeting those devices. Those attacks can come from anywhere. So that adds a, an extra layer of difficulty because it's not just a Monday through Friday, eight to five type job. Attacks can happen any day, any time, and from anywhere. The increased speed of the attacks Attackers can now launch attacks pretty regularly and automated. Not just that, how many of these new modern day attacks are actual attacks done by people? More often than not, there are services out there that are automated services that can actually launch these attacks. We can say a denial of service type attack that has a command and control server that controls 10,000 machines. That 
command and control server can be automated to actually then send out uh, automated responses to their bots to target an individual or to target a specific resource. And it doesn't take very long to do it. The bot will take their new commands and they will start initiating the attack. So the increased speed of attacks are definitely growing. Attacks are also getting more sophisticated. The tools that are out there to create the attacks, to create the exploits, are only growing. Not just that, you have individuals that work at the highest level of intelligence gathering services that are leaking what type of tools these paid professional groups are using. So the greater sophistication of the attacks are definitely growing. The sophistication of malware has been doing nothing but growing. You can go online and you can purchase malware that you can tailor to your specific item or to your specific need. Not just that, if you're lazy and you don't want to do it yourself, you can actually pay a ransomware as a service type platform. You actually run a ransomware through a ransomware campaign through this service provider. This service provider will take X amount of commission off of your attack and it does the attack for you. So again, the sophistication of the attacks aren't always the individual attacker, but the resources the attacker has access to. The availability and the simplicity of the attack tools. You don't have to have a lot of skills to use these tools anymore. However, it also comes into play, vulnerabilities are definitely being found a lot faster now, and they're not always being fixed. A lot of organizations that have vulnerabilities found may take a while to fix those vulnerabilities. Part of that is because of the delay in security updating. Sometimes the vendors are overwhelmed. Sometimes management may override the vendor and say, I don't want to do this. There were luxury car brands that were notified that the car could be actually taken over via a satellite uplink in the vehicle. And this was actually against several luxury brands. Three of the four luxury brands were like, we don't really care who's going to exploit it. The fourth luxury brand actually took it serious, patched it, and they didn't have to worry. Well, it turned out within the following several months, the three manufacturers that didn't actually fix the exploit had several of their cars hijacked. Nothing major occurred because of it, but definitely could have been. There's also a mass weakness in actual distribution of updates. We've seen uh, attacks early on, not even 10 years ago, that were using the cleanup tools like CC Cleaner that they could find, that an attacker could find, modify, and then re uh, upload to the main website so that it could distribute th this tool to everyone to actually make sure their PC was clean. However, the tool they used to make sure they were protected was actually malicious. So the distribution is always a concern. We've already talked about the distributed attacks based off of a botnet. The fun part here is more organizations are also allowing for personal use of devices. So no longer is the enterprise securing all the devices, maybe the enterprise lets you bring in your own device. Well, they have your protection, they have your security. It may not meet the enterprise stringent control requirements, but it's your personal device, so you don't need that level of security. However, once you actually start accessing those enterprise resources, you're supposed to meet the guidelines by the organization. Supposed to doesn't always mean does. Lastly, users. Why is it so hard to defend against the tax? Users. Once a user is involved, this only makes things more complicated. So now that we understand how difficult it is to actually defend against all the different types of attacks, let's go ahead and let's try to look at what is information security. 
So before defense is possible, we have to understand a few things. First, we have to have a working definition of security. What are we trying to accomplish? How does security relate to information security? What's the, ter the terminology that's going to relate to security as well? These are the three main things. All of these allow us to work on a working definition of security that is going to be used in protecting information, thus being able to define information security. So security is a few things. To be free from danger is the goal. It's the process that must achieve that freedom. So basically, as security is increased, convenience is often decreased. The more secure something is, the less convenient it may become. So we can actually think of security and convenience on a linear line. As we go towards one side of the line, we go further from the other side. I always like to use security of a classroom as a, as a great example of this. It's also convenience or availability. You can interchange those terms for this example. We can make sure a classroom is secure by locking the building. The room is secure if we do that. However, the functionality of the room is impacted. The ability of the room to do its goal is impacted. It can't do it anymore. If the student cannot get into the building, they're not allowed to get into the classroom, the classroom is not serving its purpose. So we actually have to have a balance between security and availability, convenience, functionality. That's because we have to be both secure and to a degree convenient. If something is too secure, it won't be used. If something is too convenient, it may not be easy to protect. So there has to be a nice balance between the two. So let's go ahead and spend the next few slides defining information security. It's essentially the task of securing information that is in a form, uh, typically a digital format. That means we have to be able to be safe from manipulated by storage processors or by uh, external processors. We have to make sure that it's preserved on a storage device, whether it be memory, disk storage, flash storage, long-term, short-term storage, doesn't really matter. It can also be sent over a wire, whether it be wire or wireless, the transmission, the communication portion can be sent. If we're dealing with a mobile, a mobile device, the mobile device will have storage, will have processing power, and has the ability to send and receive data. So again, here, the information security goal would be to ensure the protective measures are properly and correctly implemented to ward off attacks that would prevent the total collapse of the system when a successful attack occurs, or to prevent the exploitation of that system when a attack occurs. So it's not always the total collapse, but sometimes it's the ability to exploit a system that is the purpose. There are three types of information protection. This is op uh, often called the CIA in cybersecurity. Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Confidentiality is going to deal with encryption and protection, ensuring that only authorized individuals are able to see and access the resources they need. Integrity is going to make sure information is correct unmolested and is not modified by those not authorized to modify it. Lastly is availability. This is going to make sure that resources are available to authorized users when they need them. If we're looking at a classroom, the availability is going to be that learners have access to the classroom during the appropriate time. It's not always about is the resource always available, 
but it is uh, is it available when those that need it are authorized to actually use it that's what availability is all about so we can have CIA as the core from there we can build layers to protect that data products people policies procedures that can also policies and procedures can turn into other types of controls that can be administrative control technical or logical control or physical controls so again these are just concept layers that we build upon products are going to are going to be again they will form the basic security around the data it could be locks it could be infrastructure protection from there people that's going to be the individuals implementing the proper security products to protect the data and then again that last layer policies and procedures and that can morph into the different controls administrative technical and logical or physical controls that will be used or established by the enterprise by the business by the organization to secure the data and that means they'll ensure that the people are correctly using whatever controls that are that are there we have three main important aspects when we're talking about security items assets threats are the, the big two an asset is anything that has value it could be a physical asset it could be software intellectual property it could be non-tangible it doesn't always have to be the computer system or a device it could be the data threat is the type of action that has the potential to cause harm harm to the organization harm to an asset harm to an, uh, an infrastructure system and then the threat actor is actually the person that could carry out the threats so it's, uh, essentially we have protection protection could be a fence could be a firewall it could be a number of security controls a vulnerability is going to be a hole in that control essentially the vector the attack will use to get into the network will be that vulnerability will be that hole that allows the threat actor to get in once they're in they could look at what to steal or they could already have a pre-plan they're getting in because they want to steal something that they already know that's there there is a risk that when the threat actor actually is in the network they have certain items that they could be looking for to steal that's going to be risk in this example the, th the, the threat actor is more of a thief and they're looking to steal the scooter well there's a risk that the scooter could be stolen the scooter is going to be the tangible asset though in the real world it could be usernames could be passwords could be client lists could be cells it could be non-tangible assets or it could actually be a computer system a laptop a system it doesn't always have to be tangible it could be either or so vulnerabilities are again the flaw or weakness that a threat actor or threat agent can get through to bypass security the threat vector is the means by how the attacker is able to actually get in risk is going to be the situation that will involve the exposure of some type of danger risk is normally the potential of something occurring risk response techniques there's four main types they're not the only ones but these are the four main we can accept risk meaning that we are okay with this is the likely occurrence of happening we can accept it we could transfer risk transfer to a third party if necessary 
we could avoid risk altogether, or we could find ways to mitigate risk, make risk less serious. So for example, driving a car. We have to accept a certain level of risk when we drive a car. We might get into an accident. We might hit someone. Well, we can accept that it's happening. We can transfer part of the risk of get, driving a car by getting car insurance. We've transferred the risk to the insurance provider. Sure, we can avoid the risk altogether by not driving. However, that's not always the most realistic possibility. We can mitigate the risk by making the risk a little less. Maybe instead of driving a small sedan, we drive a, a huge truck. So if we do get into an accident, we're less likely to get hurt. We've mitigated the risk of an accident. Again, those are, that's just one example of many, but we can, throughout the course, look at other forms of risk and look at what types of techniques we can use to respond to that risk. Other uh, options are going to be things like looking at our assets, looking at likelihood. Again, likelihood is going to be probability. And in the examples we've done, we've looked at assets being tangible or intangible. We've looked at the threat. That's going to be the likelihood of something occurring. Here they're looking at the stealing of a scooter. Who's going to do it? A threat actor. We could be looking at vulnerability. That's going to be the hole in the fence, that's how they get in. The attack vector would be actually going through the hole, not just finding the hole, but actually going through the hole. And risk is the likelihood of occurrence. The interesting part is we have to go through this risk assessment, the ability to assess risk or assess potential risk on an everyday basis. We don't always consciously understand that we're doing it, but we make decisions every day that can definitely be broken down in these terms. So moving on, how do we understand the importance of information security? Well, we have to understand that that data, that information is important. Businesses derive their ability to function based off of their data typically. If you're a sales company, Nike for example, yes, you sell shoes. However, the data collected by the selling of shoes actually allow you to implement new products, to, to develop new products. So that information is just as crucial as the actual goods being sold. That means we have to protect it. So. Information security is the ability to help prevent or thwart a theft. Maybe you could uh, also eliminate or remove or lessen the likelihood of identity theft. Also, again, we talked about mandates. Well, there are actual laws in most states about the requirement of data security or information security. And if you don't comply with them, there are legal consequences of not securing your data. Also, because the their data actually runs businesses and the importance of that data to operate means without that data, you may not be able to uh, work. So securing that data allows for the ability to maintain productivity, allows workers to keep working. And if you are doing this correctly, you could help prevent cyber terrorism or other types of cyber threats or cyber attacks by ensuring that your organization is properly secured. So how do we prevent data theft? Preventing data theft from, well, being stolen is the main objective of the organization's information security. Ensuring that data is protected is part of that goal. The enterprise will have 
protection in place to ensure no one is selling proprietary organizational information or business information. Doctors or hospitals or medical uh, facilities will have mechanisms in place to ensure no one authorizes patient records unless they're authorized. If we're dealing with uh, retail stores, the ability to uh, still personalized data like credit card numbers have to be prevented. Not only are there regulations and laws and industry uh, compliance requirements, there's also an expectation by the consumers that businesses are protecting that information. Thwarting uh, identity theft, again, identity theft could be stealing someone's identity to take them over, filing um, IRS tax returns, or opening bank accounts, or opening credit cards in an individual normally used for financial gain. There are, again, tons of compliances out there that have to be in place to ensure data protection. Every, almost, not every, almost every state has data breach laws. California has the California Database Security Breach Notification Act. That actually outlines businesses that operate in California what to do. California also has California Protection Consumer Protection Act and that actually outlines what information can be collected by consumers. Very similar to what the Europeans are doing with the European Consumer Protection Act GDP. There are compliances for medical, HIPAA. There are compliances for education, FERPA. There are Compliances are dealing with the trading of information and stocks and other security related actions for publicly traded companies, SOX or SARBOX. If you're dealing with credit cards, it's going to be PCI DSS. Again, this is just a few laws or uh, compliance requirements that govern how organizations must secure their data. When we looked at maintaining productivity, we can actually break down the cost of attacks. How many workers, salary, what happens if an attack actually occurs? How many lost hours of productivity? What's the cost of the productivity? All of that can be calculated. If we're dealing with post-attack cleanup, when the Sony had a data breach, it wasn't just so much they broke in. But when Sony had to replace the majority of the equipment, they had workers sitting there for months with nothing to do because they had no equipment to work on. So it's not always the attack. Sometimes it's the cleanup of the attack that actually involves the costs. And of course, foiling cyber terrorism or cyber attacks is always a, an added bonus. Basically, any uh, premeditation politically motivated attacks against information, computer systems, technology-based systems, data, things of that nature. They're designed to cause panic, provoke violence, may even uh, be financial. It just really depends. The goal here is prevention. However, it's not just cyber terrorism. It could be cyber crime, it could be cyber attacks. So narrowing it down just to cyber terrorism is very limited. So, who does this? Who are threat actors? Uh, what, are the, what are their purposes? Again, we already know that a threat actor, in general, are individuals who launch attacks against the other users and other technology systems. Normally, there is some type of goal, not always financial, but financial is definitely in, in there. So we're looking at financial cybercrime, where we have two main categories. The first one focuses on individuals as the victim, individuals being like in the, an actual person, and second focuses on the enterprise or the government, businesses. Not so much an individual uh, entity, but a business entity. The different groups of threat actors can also widely base off of their attributes, their funding, whether they're inside or outside an organization, 
why they're doing it, their intent, their motivation, their skill level. For example, script kiddies. Script kiddies are actually individuals that have very little skill, but they know how to download the attack tools. They know how to use the attack tools. They may not understand how it works, but they know how to do it. Over 40% of the attacks require almost no skill. So when we're looking at high level attacks, that's gonna be 15% of the overall cyber attacks. Those aren't gonna be script kitties because they're, that requires way more sophistication. The more complicated attacks, not so much high, but not so much low skill, are gonna be these moderate attacks. And these moderate attacks require moderate low amount of skills. Again, you don't have to be able to create your own malware, but you have to at least understand enough on how to download a tool, how the tool functions, how the tool works, and how to actually get into a system. The system could be any type of object that you're trying to attack. So Script Kitty is definitely one of, one of the main amateur groups. We could have hacktivists. These are individuals that have ideological reasons that they don't want uh, occurring. For example, you may be against uh, companies that do makeup testing on animals. So you target makeup companies that say they do not test on animals and you know that they do. So you can break into their website and you change content to make that political statement. Hey, this company lies. Or you may disagree with the way the, a bank functions. So you hijack the bank's website or you hijack the ability for the bank to do its banking. Essentially, hacktivists are a little more skilled individuals that hack for a reason. We have nation state actors. These are typically the advanced persistent threats, and these are typically multi-year, long-term threats that target organizations and government. Nation state actors are typically individuals paid by a nation state or paid by a government to attack an enemy. These are typically known for being well uh, resourced, highly trained, and very persistent. They're getting paid to do a job, so they take this job very serious. We have internal threats. These are gonna be workers that are inside the organization. However, it could be intentional or unintentional. It could be you have a worker who's very angry at the organization, so they attack the network from inside. They actually have access to a company's resource, but they're disgruntled over something, so they can target the network. Or it could be an internal threat that was by accident. Someone social engineered a secretary to do something that they shouldn't have done. I walk in with a flasher that has my resume. I go to the receptionist going, hey, I have this interview with such and such. I just destroyed my last resume. Can you print this real quick? I give them the flash drive and they want to be a good person, so they print my resume for me. However, I just in, in, uh, installed malware on their computer when they injected the flash drive. Threats could also be external. That means outside the organization. We have a lot of other threat actors like competitors. Organized crime is always a big one. We have brokers, individuals that broker access to organizations. We have terrorists. We have cyber terrorists. We have, we have cyber crime that may not be such organized like a, like a mob. However, this could be individuals, teenagers, adults, doesn't really matter, that are a small organization that commit crime just because. You actually have threat actors that do this for research. So five fundamental security principles for defense. Layering 
as much as possible. Limiting diversity, obscurity, simplicity. Sometimes having the security overly simplistic is not always a good thing, but sometimes that's how things are protected. So let's cover these five core concepts. Layering. Essentially, security is done in layers. Not a single defense mechanism, but multiple. One layer might be too easy to circumvent. Multiple layers make it way harder. So a layered security approach, typically defined as defense in depth, can be very useful in resisting loss of attacks. If you get through one layer, doesn't matter, I have 10 more layers for them to go through. Limiting, that means limiting access to data and information so that the threat against that resource is also then limited. Only those that must use the data have access to the data. Only authorizing people with a need to access that resource, they're the only ones that should have access to the resource. For example, my job as a data processor is about inputting data. I don't need access to a printer. So I shouldn't be granted access to a printer because my access should be limited to just what I need to do my job. Uh, ways to actually limit could be technology based using permissions or it could be procedural. Actually following procedures, policies. Maybe I'm not allowed to print. That's the policy. And then they also have a technology based mechanism, control mechanism, that prevents me from printing. So it's not just one way of limiting, it's two. Diversity. Layers should be diverse. If I have a Cisco firewall for one layer, I may not want to use Cisco as the firewall for the second layer. If I, the attacker can get through one layer, they can probably get through the second layer of the same vendor. So actually having different layer uh, vendors might actually be beneficial or diverse. Again, multiple layers, not uh, using the same vendors, that way makes it a little bit harder for the attacker to get through. Obscurity. So this is always fun. Obscuring inside details to the outside, meaning you should not provide a lot of internal information to external resources. Also, some oftentimes you have controllers, like industrial controllers, that are on the network that aren't really well documented and it's secured through the uh, process called security through obscurity. No one knows about it, no one knows how they work, no one knows the addressing, but they're there because, well, they need to be there, but only the person that uses it knows all the information about it. So obscurity is not always a good thing. However, ensuring that details of a private nature aren't leaked are definitely very important. Simplicity, again, nature of information, is complex. Security is complex. So it can be difficult to understand and troubleshoot controls when implementing them. However, we do need to ensure that controls are being audited, are being verified. The goal is to ensure that whatever mechanism we are implementing for security has been verified. That's where the simplicity comes into play. We need to know how to ensure the protection. We don't want it too complex that we can't test and verify. So a lot of what we talked about today, I said things like governance. Well, there's frameworks out there that organize how information should be protected based off of the appropriate governance, based off the uh, common compliance that's required. So there are industry standard frameworks that are out there. It's industry or federal or other frameworks that can be used. These again provide the resource of how to create and how to secure the environment. It does provide the overall structure to the organization. There's various frameworks that are out there 
and it just kind of depends on what you're trying to protect. NIST, N-I-S-T, provides a lot of frameworks on security within the U.S. And that is our lecture in a nutshell. We talked about information security attacks. We talked about reasons. We talked about the difficulties in defending. We talked about protection mechanisms, confidentiality, integrity, availability. We talked about how assets are defined, threat actors, threat factors. We looked at main goals of security. We looked at how uh, threat actors fall. And we looked at how to classify our threat actors. We looked at the mechanisms for risk and associating risk, avoidance, acceptance, mitigation. We looked at also a layering mechanism for providing basic security. We looked at the other four principles, five total, layering is one of them. We looked at the other principles for security, defense, limiting diversity, obscurity, and simplicity. And we ended with a light conversation about verification and auditing. Thank you for joining me for this lecture review. If you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to reach out to me. Because I'm posting these videos on YouTube, if you leave questions in the comments, I will try to get to them as quickly as I can. However, these uh, lectures are for my official courses. So again, ask questions if need be. If you're needing additional resources to cover this material, reach out also. I do have a good amount of material. I want to thank you and look forward to working with you throughout these video lectures. Thank you.